as in the Mesoamerican world shown in previous episodes of Native American writing systems. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples of North America told tales through deliberate arrangements of intricate pictures. By the 19th century, and beginning with the Sequoia scripts for the Cherokee language, the First Nations of North America would explore ways to transcribe their spoken grammars into codified characters. The North American scripts originated not from independent invention, but rather in response to foreign pressures. So, unlike the Mesoamerican and Peruvian devices featured in previous parts of this playlist, they developed in the presence of modern nation-states. And because these writing systems are more recent and accessible than the ancient American forms, they remain in use today, even as computer fonts. This episode will explore the writing systems developed for three indigenous areas in North America. It will start with the oldest and most influential of them, the Sequoia scripts for the Cherokee language. We will then look at the basics behind Canadian Aboriginal glyphs with examples from Inuktitut and Cree. And lastly, this video will talk about the native languages between Northern California and Southwest Oregon, such as the Hoopa and Talawa. While the languages covered in this video represent different families, their respective writing systems share the common trait of characters symbolizing sound. These are phonetic representations of grammar, each character standing for a distinct sound pattern available in each language. Our first examples come from Cherokee. The story behind the man named Sequoia is as much mystery as it is epic. Born in the Cherokee town of Tuskegee in 1770, Sequoia became a polymath whose career included service as ambassador, doctor, soldier, and inventor. Despite the conflicting accounts of his background, there is little argument that his most consequential legacy was the script now named after him, which he completed by 1821. The version still used today came by accident of sorts. Although the script's characters were ready to use in printing, the Cherokee Nation's press couldn't afford to make a typeset based on the original characters, which we will see in a following image. The press compromised with a set with English letters and Arabic numerals, which the team modified into the 86 forms we see here. Seeing familiar capital letters converted into Cherokee sounds may be confusing, but it also reminds the audience that they are reading a very different language that is using a very different code. What kind of script is this? If you have watched previous episodes of the Native American Writing Systems playlist, does this character set remind you of any we have seen before? The V means the central vowel un, a nasalized schwa. You may pause here to think about the sound pattern each character may represent, or even pronounce some of them aloud. You may have noticed that almost every sound set has one vowel. With only two exceptions, each glyph symbolizes a sound set that ends in a vowel. Those in the top row stand for just the vowels themselves. Most of the rest represent consonant vowel pairs, as in the second row from top. Ka, ka, ke, ki, go, gu, ga. Cherokee vowels also have details in length and tone that these glyphs don't represent, so we can at least be aware that they have additional complexity. The description has a link to Hiroto Uchihara's study on these pronunciation rules. Each consonant vowel pair can be voiced as a single syllable. If you have seen this playlist's episodes on the ancient Maya, you may remember a very similar chart mapping glyphs to consonant vowel syllables. The Cherokee script is therefore a syllabary. As with classical Mayan, it is easy for Cherokee to use this system because of the consonant vowel patterns in their spoken language. The two exceptions mentioned earlier are nah, which ends with an aspiration, and s, which may be pronounced without a preceding or following vowel. The latter often appears in syllable final positions, as in chi squa, bird. The pronunciation rules change when Cherokee is spoken more rapidly, however. The word for 40 is spelled with syllabic characters, yet often pronounced with a consonant cluster. Pronounced directly from the syllables, this word would sound like nagis gohi. In colloquial speech, the second vowel is dropped to sound more like nags gohi. However, readers would still know how to pronounce the word from the character sequence. It is similar to English speakers knowing when to pronounce or drop the final E, written for latte versus mat. One last remark about Sequoia's Cherokee syllabary is that the version used today was not his first. I link to this chart, available from the Cherokee Nation, in the description box. The Cherokee are a rare example in world history of an entire nation adopting a script invented by a single member. They would profoundly influence how the First Nations of North America would represent their languages, 
and through this, their identity in written characters. Among the first to follow were the Aboriginal and Inuit peoples of Canada, with a script distinct to that country. Popularly called the Star Chart, these glyphs represent the sounds of spoken Cree. Do you see any patterns to how they are arranged here? You may pause here to look at the symbols and find an answer. Similar to the Cherokee scripts we just saw, here each shape represents a consonant-vowel combination. In this case, each consonant has its own shape, which rotates depending on the following vowel. This is a special kind of writing system called abugida. The consonant defines the base shape for each glyph, modified per additional sounds. Modifying glyphs by rotation is unique to the Canadian Aboriginal languages. Because each language has its own grammatical rules, it may have its own unique take on the characters in Canadian Aboriginal script. Cree, for example, may mark a glyph with a dot at one side to indicate lip rounding. Wa rounded from a, kwa rounded from ka, pui rounded from pi. In Nuktitut, which uses consonants such as r and v, not spoken in Cree, will represent these with glyphs as well. While designed specifically for indigenous languages, the Canadian Aboriginal script is the first in this playlist that was not created by an indigenous person. Methodist missionary James Evans was exploring ways to transliterate the Bible and Christian services into texts for Cree and Ojibwe speakers to read the doctrine in their own languages. The scripts have become secularized since their initial form. Notice that the Inuktitut script is very similar to the Cree as they share a common origin. Despite the overlapping characters, the sound set or phonetic inventory used in Inuktitut is very different from Cree. Inuktitut uses uvular consonants such as k and r that are not pronounced in Plains Cree. These two are rotated depending on the companion vowel. Inuktitut is a good example of an important principle among writing systems worldwide. When the glyphs encode the sound sets of a language, these will usually represent the language's phonemes. Phonemes are the contrastive elements of sound in a language, such that speakers will recognize different meanings if they think the sound differences matter. In English, for example, whether a vowel is lengthened will not change the meaning of a word. We hear moot as just a funny way to say moot, yet this lengthening comes naturally when pronounced in mood. Inuktitut does hear long and short vowels as different when either is pronounced in the same position, and vowel length is therefore phonemic. Compare ikaluk with Ikaluk. The Inuktitut characters will mark for this difference because the language requires it. We therefore know that short U and long U are phonemic in the language. Another rule about phonemes is that they may be pronounced differently depending on their position in a syllable or word. Linguists call this rule complementary distribution. An example in American English is the vowel length rule before voiced consonants, especially voiced stops. T and D are contrastive phonemes in English, so speakers perceive difference between them in pairs such as ton and done. Try for yourself to pronounce these two words, and see if you notice a difference in how long you pronounce the E in each. Try it again with the O in these two. Did one sound longer than the other? English vowels regularly lengthen before voiced consonants such as D, B, and G. This shows how a sound's environment may affect how you pronounce the sound within it. The Y of Inuktitut works similarly. Compare Kayak with Kekektarjwak and Ukpigjwak. The Y and J are written with the same consonant form, but they are pronounced differently depending whether it follows a consonant. The two sounds therefore represent alternate pronunciations of the same phoneme Y. In linguistics, these alternating forms are allophones. Canadian Aboriginal script is used for the Inuktitut dialects spoken in Nunavut and Nunavik, the northernmost region of Quebec. Even though it was invented by a foreigner, it remains widely used in public spaces, and it is even available as a web font. With it, I could write out Isuma Yunaktutit, you can think. Our final case will look into the Uniphone script adapted for the native languages of Northern California. Much like Canadian Aboriginal, the California communities would transform Uniphone, an outsider's invention, into designs for their own use. In the 1950s, Dr. John R. Malone led a team promoting a new method to improve teaching literacy to inner-city Chicago children. 
he created a system to bypass the difficulties perceived with letters that could confuse learners because they were pronounced inconsistently. The solution, he believed, was to offer a truly transparent alphabet. Each and every letter would mark its own unique sound, so there would no longer be confusion over how to pronounce a C, S, or TH as examples. At Humboldt State University, Professor Tom Parsons realized that this new alphabet, then called Unifone, could be used to record the native languages of Northern California to written texts. Parsons began a program to train teachers how to apply Unifone letters to the sounds of local native languages, such as Yurok, Hoopa, and Talawa. Between the 1970s and 80s, the teachers embraced Unifone. This is the first example in our native writing systems playlist of a true alphabet adapted by indigenous speakers. For the first time in this series, each character in the script would correspond to a distinct sound segment in the given grammar. But as with the Cherokee case presented earlier, the script didn't capture all the sound variants of the spoken language. Yet the speakers accepted it because it was at least devised within their own culture. This was an important argument for Talawa especially. Talawa is an Athabascan language traditionally spoken in the western border between Oregon and California. Anthropologist James Collins, a scholar in Talawa language and ethnic identity, outlined two major sticking points over using uniform characters to teach and write Talawa. On one side, this alphabet wasn't initially designed for certain sounds in the language, such as its glottalized consonants. On the other side, the Talawa speakers themselves had actively contributed to developing the alphabet for their own language and culture. And although the glyphs came from an outside invention, the alphabet was the Talawa's own investment, even if incomplete. By the 1980s, these California language communities would replace Unifone with the Latin alphabet. But because the Talawa alphabet had such involvement from its own speakers, it lasted the longest until the Latin alphabet superseded this one at last. Unifone remains an important artifact in the history of transcribing Native American languages into written texts. The Native American Writing Systems Playlist concludes with today's mask. Please join us for the final episode.